Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Katie Earl. I'm the coordinator of the University Express program, and we're joined here virtually with my colleague, Rachel Vega, also from Senior Services. So before we get started, if you have any questions while Rachel's going through her presentation, please feel free to type it into the Q&A. If you're new to us, you'll find the Q&A on the lower right hand side of your screen. If you're using a computer, it's Q&A and it has a box with a question mark. And if you're on a tablet or smartphone, poke or touch your screen, that'll bring up your control panel and then you'll be able to find your Q&A there. We are recording this session and I'll try to post it on our website at some point this week. And you might also think you're the only people here with us today, but I promise you there are others. It's just that we're in an anonymous participation mode, so you can't see who else is in here with us. We'd like to thank the sponsors of our program, which is our Department of Senior Services, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Excelsior Orthopedics, and Wegmans for everything they do to make the program possible. And if you ever have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact our department. We're at 858-8526. And Rachel's gonna go through a little bit about what we do and how we can help you today. So while she's fixing her audio, I'm gonna introduce you to her. Ms. Vega has worked in providing services to the community for over 20 years. Ms. Vega has worked for both private and public sector assisting persons obtain benefits such as Medicaid, Child Health Plus, and the former Healthy New York programs as a facilitated enroller. She's also assisted individuals obtain employment, both long and short term, temporary and permanent. Rachel began her service to the residents of Erie County as a protective services worker, assisting vulnerable adults of Erie County, and then moved on to working with persons of all ages in New York Connects, where she is now one of our aging and disability resource representatives. Good morning, everyone. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, they're sort of inevitable in this day and age, even though we've advanced to this point, we've, we've caught up somewhat to the Jetsons. We're still at a point where things haven't been perfected and we've, we've got a mix of the Jetsons and the Flintstones. If you can relate. Um, uh, so welcome to today's uh, University Express, which is about our financial benefits checkup you gave now safe. Um, as Katie introduced, my name is Rachel Vega, and I'll be walking you through some of the processes, uh, some giving you some vital information that you um, maybe perhaps this pandemic, this era of the pandemic have had you considered um, exercising your right to apply for some of these benefits. Uh, just a little bit of history, uh, the Erie County Senior Services um, had recently been um, given some grants. Um, we recently applied for a grant a couple of years back and we, are, we were awarded what they called a benefit enrollment center grant uh, over the course of two years to enroll as many uh, Erie County residents into the benefits and entitlement programs such as uh, SNAP, HEAP, Medicaid, and um, the low income subsidies and uh, Medicare savings programs. Um, we were a success at our grant, and lo and behold, um, we thought we were finishing that grant, and our grant got extended. Uh, we, um, we were in a bit of a surprise, but then came the pandemic. Well, the pandemic thrusted us into the grant, um, into success, being more successful with the grant. And now we also have an opportunity because of, of the result of the pandemic and the success that we've been having at the rate of which we've been enrolling folks or assisting persons with their paperwork and their recertification. We've, we're looking at possibly obtaining that grant again um, and it, with an extension of about a couple of years, which would be um, very helpful to the public. So I'll get on with that. Uh, 
As a part of our benefit enrollment center, the grant is geared towards individuals who have Medicare. So we're hoping that everyone who is attending today, if you don't have Medicare, possibly you know someone who does have Medicare, that you would uh, share this information with them. And if you're uncomfortable with sharing this information with them, that you would at least provide them with our telephone number. And if they should have any further questions, that they would then give us a call and get that information more directly from us. So our uh, our theme or our um, our catchphrase for the enrollment benefit enrollment center is: Do you have Medicare? It's your time to save. Uh, what you will learn today is that um, we're looking at breaking the stigma of government assistance. There's no shame in this end game. Everyone has put in in some way, shape, or form. Um, as a citizen of this country and a person who's maybe worked as a legal resident, you have contributed and with your contributions, you're going to learn about the five core benefits for people who are on Medicare. You'll also learn what the income and asset limits for each of these benefits are and other cost saving benefits programs. You'll also learn about um, they, there's a stigma that people think that they don't qualify, but there are several financial disregards. There really isn't a, um, in some cases, um, for certain programming, there is a, a, a sort of a forgiveness. There are potential loopholes. In others, there aren't. Um, some programs function um, a little more with a little bit more leniency than others. It just depends on your situation. You got to figure out what's the right fit for you. Um, you'll also learn how your situational changes, such as loss of income from a job or a spouse, or any kind of like let's say you significant other or. Um, medical bills or the need for assistance due to your health. Um, could change whether or not you might actually be eligible for the program. You might not qualify now, but as limits increase yearly and in the event your income isn't increasing or you, have, you may have some sort of fixed income that might allow for you to, um, to gain entry into the programs. We find that folks, uh, we've identified four particular barriers to applying and we find that people just don't have an awareness of programs. I was just speaking yesterday with someone who was calling about something different. It had to do with, uh, with some home repairs and, um, and we're not here to talk about home repairs today, but this is my example. There was just a lack of awareness as far as what agencies really dealt in that particular individual's um, the, the residential area and the coverage and how it works. And so uh, we were able to have a discussion around that and, and bring some awareness of how um, how these grants and activities are funded where she lives. And it goes according by in that particular case for what she was applying for, it goes according to, you know, um, zip code and the community you're in. So there's this lack of awareness of programs. Um, a lot of folks tend to think that the application process is tedious or they just are overwhelmed by the paperwork when they see it and uh, what was once English turns into gobbledygook or gibberish. So people then lose their ability to fill out paperwork and we're here totally to assist with that. They're, they're very basic processes. Um, a lot of folks don't know where to begin to apply. People don't realize that we actually can just simply mail certain applications and if folks are computer savvy, we would gladly uh, walk you through the process of how to get going online. There are there are different options and in this day and age of COVID, we have had some leniency. Um, there have been some provisions made in that sense that they're heavily regarding now as opposed to doing face to face visits with folks, you simply have to mail something you just have to mail the application in along with doc supporting documents. Um, and lastly, this is the most common barrier to people getting um, this 
entitlements and ben these benefits is just believing that other people need more help. And saying, well, maybe I didn't get it because there's somebody else out there that needs it more than me. We hear that all the time. Oh, I'd rather let somebody else who needs it more than me. Well, your income falls within the guideline. If I've reviewed that with you and your incomes fall within the guideline, you are the person that needs it. If you've been identified as the individual that even gets the minimum, well, that's your entitlement and, and you should, um, not that you should try to take advantage of a system, but it clearly identifies you as being an individual who meets the criteria and you're not stealing this from anyone. So um, we got to let pride get out of the way um, because in this day and age, everyone needs some form of help in some way, shape or form, whether it be financial, you could be a financial guru and, and have a top-notch uh, accounting system and, and live bare bones and, and have a great savings. But, um, you know, things happen suddenly and um, that can all be wiped away no matter how diligent and how well you are managed. So our Benefit Enrollment Center, um, we, we would like to ask out there who has Medicare and who can we help? Well, we can help older adults who are 65 years of age or older. Uh, the young and disabled, you can be below 65 as long as you have Medicare. Um, we actually help. Our, the purpose of our Benefit Enrollment Center is to assist those who have Medicare, but our office is not opposed to assisting anyone who needs assistance. So let me just preface that. Um, the Benefit Enrollment Center is a way for us to be recognized for the work that we're doing, but we've been doing this work all along, whether we get paid um, additional grant funding or not, that is something that our office is always, it, it lines up with our mission. So um, the Benefit Enrollment Center can help those on Medicare apply for or recertify for any of these benefits. They are Medicare, the Medicare Savings Program, which coincides with the low income subsidy as well as the SNAP supplemental nutritional assistance program which formerly was known as food stamps uh, and the home energy assistance program also known as heap or lie heap as they call it in other states snap and heap go hand in hand and lastly medicaid Let's talk about Medicare and we're going to go through this pretty quickly. If you have any questions about Medicare, we can go more in depth. We have a health insurance information counseling assistance program, also known as HICAP. And our HICAP counselors, uh, Bill Daniels and Sue Lord, along with our additional staff in the office, can go more in depth and on the over the phone as to any further questions you might have about that. But um, good, if, if anyone isn't familiar, um, there is uh, several, there are several parts to Medicare and they are known as part A, part B. Um, and what are they? Well, part A is the insurance that covers your hospitalization. Part B, what is it and who pays for it? Part B is the coverage. Part A, you get that. That's something that's um, provided to you once you paid into the system and you reach 65. Part B, Part B is the part of the insurance that you make a contribution towards that comes out of your social security check. And it covers what's not hospital. Um, it covers services um, like going to your primary doctor and specialists, any kind of labs. Um, and who pays for it? You wind up paying for it. Um, additionally, people ask, do I need both parts? Well, that depends on your situation. I don't know anyone that doesn't need part A, um, but definitely um, depending on your situation, whether you continue to work and are covered by an employer or um, your situations change, eventually uh, people do need Part B. Um, 
what is part D? There's also a part D. And, and why is there a C missing? Well, the C has to do with like a, um, when you're trying to un unify both of these, the part A and the part B, the C has to do with um, the, the advantage plans that would um, work those together. And that, that's a separate piece. But part D is actually your um, prescriptions, um, your prescription coverage. And that too can be standalone. Our office can assist with choosing a separate Part D plan or that that Part C that unifies the parts A and B uh, by choosing a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, we provide non-biased information and counseling. We have a lot of literature that does a lot of comparisons across the board for what's relevant to the area we live in. So the Medicare Savings Program, a lot of you may or may, or may not know this, but um, Social Security takes out of your check each month to pay for your Part B premium. That rounds up to be upwards of about $144 plus dollars a month, depending on when you join the system. Some estimates put close to half of all eligible Medicare beneficiaries have not applied. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I can safely say that our office, amongst the over 100 phone calls we receive a day, we generally see, receive at least three to five phone calls regarding the Medicare Savings Program for people who are newly applying. And we're mailing, we send out mailers for persons that are what we perceive or based on our questioning, um, view as being eligible. Um, a lot of folks are new to Medicare and, and, and that's when they generally find out about it because they're, they see that this, this amount of money is coming out of their checks so they newly apply. And then there are those persons who just never knew and just automatically assumed this is how it is. And because it's coming out, there's no way around it. And I, they just accept it. But that's not, you don't have to accept it. So let's move on. Um, the Medicare Savings Program can put that money back into your check every month. Giving you back to the top, your gross um, monthly allotments. That's the Medicare Savings Program. Now moving on to the Low Income Subsidy Program, also known as LIS. Uh, LIS is also known as Extra Health. A lot of people go, oh, but what's LIS? I get extra help. Okay, that's great. It's the same thing. It helps pay for your Part D costs. Um, a person with extra help saves on average $4,900 per year on prescription drug costs. Being enrolled in the Medicare Savings Program, which was the first uh, program I discussed, means you're automatically then enrolled in the Low Income Subsidy Program. They go hand in hand. So just let me switch back a little bit. The Low Income Subsidy, the extra help, what the extra help does is it fits you into this category of, of brackets so your, your prescription costs don't exceed they don't go beyond a certain amount. I don't have the figures in front of me. Let me take a quick look and see if I have paperwork. That gets into detail. Um, but it, it fits them into brackets. So depending on where your income falls in any of those categories, your scripts should not go beyond a certain amount, okay? Which is critical because you wanna know how much you're paying you know, and what category your script's falling. Hey, Rachel. Now, there are exceptions because, you know, there are exceptions to what's being covered, but for the most part, um, it, it helps manage the costs of your prescriptions and give you the ability to know what your co-payments are going to be if they're going to be fixed. Moving on to the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, called SNAP, also known, formerly known as Food Stamps. 
the benefits before you are, are to, um, well, let me give you the quick history. Um, SNAP was designed to, um, to bring uh, needed nutritionist um, options to folks as a form of getting folks, um, you know, more of a farm to table type situation where you're getting your fresh fruits and vegetables and, and your dairy um, into your diet. Um, your staples, if you will. The eligibility criteria for SNAP, um, if your income, which is, it's based on income and your family size. So depending on your household, um, the amount to be coming up shortly is, is um, less than or equal to the charge below, you might be eligible for SNAP benefits. If the gross income is below these amounts, it doesn't ensure that you'll be eligible for the benefit, but we certainly uh, encourage you to apply. Uh, the SNAP budget is generally calculated. What does SNAP do? They actually use your um, expenses related to your household as far as whether or not you actually pay rent or mortgage. And even if you're clear of a mortgage, perhaps you pay taxes, which can be pretty costly on a fixed income. Um, they will take a look at your yearly taxes. They'll take a look at the insurance that you pay on your household, on the home, the homeowner's insurance. Um, they'll take a look at the fact some people rent and they have some utilities included. Well, if you're living in your own home, you have to pay your own utilities. So they'll take a look at the fact that you pay for your utility, utilities separately, water, gas, electric. Um, now, in the case of seniors or the disabled, also takes a look at the cost that you have on your medical expenses, um, whether or not you're spending for monthly um, co-payments towards medications, as well as doctor visits, as well as insurance. All of that gets rolled up into a calculation and then determines what amount of SNAP you would receive. For a family size of one, the total monthly gross income limits has risen. Um, it generally goes up uh, the, so let's say um, in October, um, October, which would be October 1st of every year, the, inc the allotments increase. This year we've seen several increases. Um, the federal government has put forth several initiatives and with the new uh, administration, um, we've seen allotments, the monthly gross income um, limits to rise up to 21, 26 for family size of one and 2873 for family size of two with an annual gross income of 25,512 for households of one and 34,476 for households of two persons. Now you're saying, hmm, well, sounds interesting. It gets better. Um, what we found, and, and I'm going to go through the myths. Actually, I'm just going to give you my own scenario. What we found this year with the um, pandemic is that um, we've seen an increase in persons who had sudden job loss. We've seen an increase in persons who not only had sudden job loss, they lost their homes. We've seen a sudden increase in persons, individuals, moving back in with their parents, their elderly parents, and now becoming part of the household. And now, so what happens? Now everyone is sharing and there's this commingling. Um, so there is this great need identified. Um, and if, if you're not eligible, because not everyone was eligible for unemployment, and unemployment clearly didn't cover a whole salary, you now have families joining together to live in this household and and there's deficits there's clearly deficits and um so we're seeing more and more people applying for snap um as a way to contribute so to speak or not take away from um 
the household itself, because if now this person's providing you a roof over your head, you have to maintain at least your needs and the basic needs would, in this case would be food, right? Um, so we've seen this increase and we've seen people um, who were in the case of the pandemic, and I'm going to skip through these myths because I'm just telling you real life stuff. Um, we've seen that people who once received that $16 SNAP amount, I've heard so many people call and say, well, what do you get for that $15, $16? Those were the old amounts. The amounts have since increased to $19 minimum SNAP allotment. Um, and we're finding that at the onset of the pandemic for the months of, um, that was 2020, so for the months of April, May, June, any household who was getting that minimal $19 amount, it was, Increase the government then gave them an additional allotment, recognizing that the cost of food had increased, recognizing the the need um, that was so great, and everybody was running up, running out of toilet paper, so they were running for toilet paper, and they were spending money on other items in addition to just food because it's not just about the food. Um, The government increased the ink, the not the income limit, but they increased the allotment from what was fifteen, sixteen dollars up to the maximum amount, which back then might have started off at one hundred and ninety four. So people were now not only getting the nineteen, they were getting the difference to bring them up to the maximum amount allotment. The maximum allotment at this point has since increased. Um, and the maximum allotment currently for a single person is $234. The minimum amount of the benefit you can currently receive is 19. However, because we're still in this pandemic status, your minimum allotment might be $19, but during certain periods throughout the year, they've been giving these increases. So you could see yourself receiving a $234 benefit as it's designated. So if you're in a month where it's been designated to receive that, you could very well have been receiving that. And if you were eligible for this all this time and you hadn't received it, you just missed out on getting $234 for the last few months. Even if you were at that $19 amount, let's just say if you were at the $19 a month amount. So folks stood, stand to still gain from this. We The designation uh, has not changed. We are still under this um, what they call a disaster declaration. And um, I would encourage you if you were hesitating or unsure that you you do take the time to consider um, you're, you're taking the time now to consider taking this this class to understand that things change and um, and there are opportunities for people to not necessarily get ahead, but to live a better quality of life as a result, regardless of what we have faced before us, okay? So we skipped those myths, and I just have to tell you that real life situation, that that's what's happening now. Um, and we just ask that if you are interested, uh, give us a call, keep calm and fill out the form. The forms are easy to complete. We would gladly walk you through them once you got them to home. We would try to pre-fill any information. Um, they mostly require two signatures or signatures in certain sections and then supporting documentation. We gladly mail out a packet to you and the packet would include not only the application, but instructions and a listing of the documents that are necessary to make the application complete. We also include an envelope with which you can mail it back to. Next topic is HEAP. Hmm. And out of all the programs, I think HEAP is the most, you would think SNAP, but HEAP is probably the most popular because we live in Buffalo, New York, and our weather and, and, and the fresh air we receive um, keeps us at a point where I don't know about anyone else, but I still have my heat on just because 
taking the chill out of the air on these damp days. Um, and because of that, um, my heating bill can be pretty um, costly, but um, I, I like to be comfortable. It's my home, and if that's my only place I'm comfortable in and I work hard, well, I'm going to put that heat up. But for those of us that have to remain at home and have been remaining at home throughout the pandemic, trying to keep the rest of, of, of everyone else afloat and safe, um, for certain and for sure, your um, heating bills have risen. Your electric bills have risen as a result, no matter how much you try to, you know, turn the heat down and save, it's unavoidable. Their own costs for um, providing the services have increased, and then our usage coupled with that it just keeps going up. Just to give you some more information, heat will be able to help you heat help if you heat your home with electricity, natural gas, oil, propane, wood, wood pellets, kerosene, and corn. Um, for persons who live in the more rural communities, we have had folks who heated with wood. Uh, we do have several people that we service that heat with propane and oil. Um, kerosene is probably the most expensive out of these. I'm not sure. Certain things you can get for free. Kerosene is not one of them. So I could see where people would heat with wood and, you know, they're chopping the wood out of their own home. But kerosene, corn, certain things just can't be um, replaced that easily and be quite costly. So, um, one thing I have to say about encouraging you to apply for heat, you can still apply. Yes, it is, what's today's date? May 4th. May the 4th be with you. <laughs> for our Star Wars fans. Any Star Wars fans out there? May the 4th be with you. Okay. So this uh, year, as well, well, last year that we went through the same uh, kind of thing, but this year, last year was unprecedented. Last year, uh, the heat um, benefit had been extended and increased in the sense that um, the benefit uh, program benefit typically closes uh, April 15th. It was extended through August 31st of last year. This year, they decided midway point um, about a month back, they did inform us they were extending the benefit again this year. Uh, the funding had been extended again this year through August 31st of this year. So you still have time to apply for the regular heat benefit. What does the regular heat benefit get you? Um, your regular heat benefit could get you up to $401 of um, Heat of funding towards either towards your heating bill, depending on what you heat with. So if your primary heating source is any of the other things that I identified, you could get up to that amount uh, for the basic benefit. Um, and, and what you see on the screen is just basically saying, you know, household size and income. These are the there are. What are the eligibility criteria? We're going to go on next on the next screen. It'll tell you what the um, amounts are. Um, but, um, and we'll do that next. The guidelines for the heat uh, benefit for household size of one, the regular benefit would be no more than $2,600, $2,610. And then for um, the gross monthly income for household size of two would be $3,413. So it's pretty uh, significant there. Um, most of the folks that apply for these programs, quite honestly, um, we find a large targeted amount of folks income don't exceed more than $2,000 a month when you're living on a fixed income. Now, there may be those of you out there that have a higher income threshold, more than $2,000 a month, but I'm speaking to those that aren't in that category and they're below that. Um, that is uh, a significant amount of the population. When we receive applications, we see incomes below $2,000 a month applying for these programs. And whether you have a, 
above that, that's great. We want you to apply as long as you meet the guidelines. We definitely want you to um, take advantage of what you are entitled and eligible for. Um, so keep and and there's a lot of garbage on the screen. There's a lot of information on here, but it's the basics are if you are in doubt or have a question about it, give us a call and we encourage that you apply. Um, keep um, applying doesn't hurt anyone. It just if, if you're not eligible, once you've applied and you're deemed not eligible, then you you're not eligible. You wouldn't get it. But if you are eligible, um, being eligible for the one basic benefit also makes you get eligible for the potential for an emergency benefit. Um, the emergency benefit is based on whether or not you have a, um, a shut off or in danger of, of a shut off or in danger of low fuel supply or um, wood supply or, or whatever the heating source is. If you have less than, let's say for those persons out using propane, less than a quarter of a tank of fuel, then um, you can still get some now. And if that is the case, and you already applied, so let's say somebody out there that's watching this program has already applied for HEAP and received their, their regular benefit. A lot of people don't even know you can get an emergency benefit. If you already received your regular benefit and you have a low fuel supply or you have a shut off notice or a collection notice because they're not really shutting people off anymore. What's happening is they they had a moratorium that's been extended. So for the most part, they're not shutting anyone off, but they're still looking for payments. You need to call us today. If you already received, were in receipt of a basic heat benefit and you are in danger of shut off or have a low fuel supply, you need to call us. We will make arrangements to get another additional benefit, which is called an emergency benefit. This year, like last year, what HEAP has done is they have uh, made provision for more than just your regular benefit. They made provision for an emergency benefit. The emergency benefit has been um, extended as well. There were uh, in previous years, one or two benefits this year. There are three up to three emergency benefits for the household. So not only just your regular benefit, if you have a situation where you're exhausting <clears throat> your um, your heating and, and you just need that to heat and you can't pay it, you could potentially be eligible for not one, not two, but up to three emergencies. There are conditions that apply with those, but you won't know unless you call us. We'll, we'll figure it out. Please give us a call today. In addition to your heating of the home, um, and oh, quickly, let me go backwards. One thing about the emergency heat benefit, and I'm relaying this from a sheet that I have before me because the emergency um, benefit amount is different from your regular amount. Um, if you're heating with natural gas, the benefit amount would be three hundred and fifty dollars. Um, if you're heating with electric heat, because there are people out there that live in in certain situations where they're on a, an electric heat situation, that benefit would be four hundred and ninety dollars. If you're heating with the most costly, which is the oil or the kerosene or the propane, that benefit is six hundred and seventy five dollars. Um, so it's worth applying, it's worth checking into, it's worth looking at whether or not you're eligible for an emergency benefit based on your situation. And once again, there's no shame in applying. Nobody's seeing you physically. Nobody is um, condemning the application process. There's no one here to um, to just, you know, think ill of you. Um, 
these benefits of designs with uh, keeping you afloat and um, making sure that you're there's some quality to your life. Um, next, we have uh, a lesser known benefit uh, as a part of the HEAT program, which generally, and I apologize for this, this date that's on here, but um, there is what's called a clean and tune program. Is it always available? It, it opens back in 2018. And at that, since that point, it really never closed, so it remains open. Um, and what the benefit does, it basically provides um, that you could have a clean and a tune. So an eligible household could receive um, a cleaning of the primary heating equipment, um, which could in some cases include like chimney cleaning, uh, installation of a carbon monoxide detector or programmable thermostats if need, needed, okay? Um, so the guidelines exist in the same way as the HEAT. Um, the only thing about the Clean and Tune program is that once you apply for Clean and Tune, um, it, it's a 12-month a program. So you might have had a Clean and Tune, let's say you have it in May of this year. Well, you can't keep cleaning and tuning it throughout the year. So clean and tune is a one shot deal until the following May. So after the 12 months have been completed from the last time you had a clean and tune. And cleaning and tuning the, the equipment is what, you know, extends the life of your equipment because that further adds to savings down the road. Last but not least, um, we have what's called the um, per benefit or the um, heating equipment repair and replacement benefit. A lot of folks aren't familiar with this benefit either. Um, you know, there may be someone in the audience that um, has benefited from it, or there may be folks that haven't that don't realize that, you know, or don't know, they just try to take care of whatever they have and aren't really in a position, don't really know or have a savings for equipment in the home and pray that it, it lasts another few years as long as, you know, they're in the home. Um, if you are eligible for HEAP, because this is one of those programs that if you, if you're a homeowner, homeowner and eligible for HEAP, then um, you could potentially be eligible for the heating equipment repair and replacement benefit to help you repair or replace your furnace. The furnace has to be in non-working order. Um, it can't be just because I want to replace it and it's old. It has to be in non-working order. And if the condition is found to be in non-working order, um, or if you report that it's a non-working order, uh, we would have you give you a listing of vendors. Um, in this case, they they require two estimates from participating vendors, and um, the estimates are free. If you request the the vendor to provide you with a free heap estimate, the vendor provides that estimate to heap, and then um, heap would follow up with the vendor um, to have it, and you know conduct the repair or installation in your home. Um, this is a process that doesn't happen immediately. It does require that you do complete an application. Uh, in most recent years, last year was the first year that you were able to, if you, if you have access to a computer and able to operate a computer, they were taking applications for this heating equipment repair replacement on the computer as well, which was a quicker process. But generally, a paper application needs to be completed and submitted. Um, in the case of these emergencies, we do advise persons if you're looking to have this done quickly, the best advice is to get a hold of that paperwork. If it means coming down to our offices, having it completed in person, and turning it in with any necessary documentation to at least get that part of the process sped up and then. Iron out the particulars, which have to do with getting the vendor out to the home, providing the estimate, and then 
um, having that go to them so that it can move quicker. No one wants to be in their home without heat at this time. At the time when your furnace isn't working. And last but not least, um, another benefit, um, which will soon be coming upon is we should be opening up relatively soon. But when we get those days where we warm up is a cooling benefit. Um, there is a cooling assistance heat. If um, an individual who uh, is eligible for heat um, under the normal guidelines has a um, medical condition further exacerbated by the heat, um, they would um, look at providing you, and, and let's say you don't have a working air conditioner or the air conditioner you have is not working or, or it's older than five years, you potentially could um, receive a air conditioner to cool the area and area of your home. They're not going to supply you with an air conditioner to cool the entire home. They're going to supply you with an air conditioner to cool a section of your home where you can, um, you know, spend primary parts of your time a day to cool off, give you a cooling space. There is a separate application for that. If there's anyone um, who is viewing and interested and has a um, has a need and, and a medical condition, please give us a call. We'll gladly uh, provide you with that very short application. And the fifth program um, that I'm here to discuss with you today is Medicaid. Um, Medicaid has provision to uh, provide uh, payment for medical medically needed assistance both in the community as well as long-term care and for nursing homes. Um, there are, and I won't get too much into Medicaid just because um, everyone's situation is a little different and if you have questions, we'd like to discuss them at length with you to discuss your options and you can do that by calling 858-8526. And any one of our case managers can do a run through with you regarding Medicaid. But Medicaid can be available to you if you reside in the community. Um, and you have a need for services within your home um, and find that you may not necessarily um, be able to. Um, or if you find yourself limited in and how you're going to pay for those services, um, we would gladly discuss with you your need um, and how to go about accomplishing that. A lot of people, I'm assuming, if you're in attendance, you may not need it now, or you might have, I may be assuming wrong, you could have a loved one at home and you came out today or, or you're online and, and you just wanted to find out more about it. This would be the program that has a lot of different um, methods, or I don't want to call them loopholes, but there are a lot of different disregards for different situations, depending on your situation, whether you are or aren't married, whether you own a home or don't own a home, and depending on what your assets look like, um, would determine the type of Medicaid you could access. There are other options um, which could also uh, give you access to Medicaid, which would be legal remedies such as participating in a pooled trust. So if you have any Medicaid questions, I would direct you to give us a call today at 858-8526. Additionally, other than the five core programs, there are other financial benefits that we do assist with. Uh, Right now, um, our complimentary card uh, machine is, um, we're trying to work out the kinks. It's a technical difficulty of getting a, how to get a photo on the complimentary card, but this complimentary card is for the NFTA and it is to offset the expense associated with bus or train fare. Uh, it's also known as like a reduced fare pass 
or the complimentary card. The complimentary card is for seniors who are age uh, 62 and over. And um, it gives you the ability to pay half fare. So if the fare is $5 for an all day pass to utilize the train or the bus, you'd be paying $2.50 for the fair to access an all day pass. Um, other programming that we assist with application wise are for the EPIC, um, New York State EPIC, which is the pharmaceutical benefit. Um, applications are readily available in our office and we gladly mail those out. That's a very simple application with um, generous income guidelines to offset the cost of um, your prescription drugs. Um, we also assist with applying for um, what they call a lifeline discount or the free cell phone through the um, Assurance Wireless or SafeLink Wireless, which are the contractors. Um, also a variety of tax benefits. So let's say you are uh, perhaps a homeowner and you need to apply for your, um, what they call the property tax exemption. Those are things that we can either provide you with some guidance or uh, um, direct you as to where you can go. Typically it's either your town or your city, depending on where in any county you reside. Um, there's also um, what they call an IT 214 tax rebate, which is a um, benefit for homeowners and renters who pay a high percent of income on rent or property taxes. Um, there are forms for that as well. We've seen with the pandemic that um, there are some places that aren't, um, we get a lot of calls from people looking to file their taxes or assistance with filing and the filing deadlines coming up May 17th. Thank God it's been extended, but um, so we've seen a lot of folks call us about getting assistance with us, getting assistance for filing, actually having someone prepare their taxes. Um, not certain if, depending on, on, you know, where you live, but certain senior centers still continue to have volunteers who do operate on a uh, appointment only basis to continue to serve the public in, um, in applying or um, completing their taxes or filing their taxes. Um, I don't want to throw names out there, but there are some senior centers that are still operating in this way. I would also check with your local library um, on a on a case by case basis, depending on the area, there are still some folks that are still operating the um, what they call the um, the of volunteers, the tax volunteers are still out there. They're just operating on um, maybe on an appointment basis. And if you live in the city of Buffalo, I would advise you to give us a call. We do have some information as to who um, is operating. And depending on your situation, it, it might be advantageous to you to call us and we would gladly give you that information, 858-8526. Other areas we assist with information uh, regarding home modifications. Who doesn't want to save or receive assistance with um, the potential for getting your roof repaired or windows replaced or weatherization services? Those are all things that we would gladly guide you in the direction depending on where you live because it is based on um, which town and municipality you are in. Um, and whether, you know, and also your income, um, we would gladly share whatever information we have available. Also, um, veterans benefits. Our commissioner is a veteran. Um, he's actually active to um, some degree. And um, we have a heart for our vets. Um, and if we aren't able to help you in some way, shape or form, we're gonna try to direct you to the place that um, we'll be able to provide you with some assistance. Um, once again, that number is 858-8526.
And this little image here is uh, an image of what was where we had a, um, a dream of having a benefit enrollment bus coming to a place near you. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to resume being mobile again. But at this point in time, we are um, on a pause status and slowly moving in that direction. And so we do look forward to serving the public uh, face to face again. Um, we do encourage you to continue with the mail. Um, but thank you for having me today. And once again, if you have any questions, give us a call. 858-8526. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for educating us on all of those services that we didn't really know about and the changes that have been made since the pandemic. Um, we have a couple questions. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, the first question is, are the low income subsidy and EPIC the same thing? No, they are two separate programs. The low income subsidy is something that you get um, through the social well, social security administration or Medicare. So local the low income subsidy is something. There are two separate applications if that's what you're leaning toward. Epic is a New York state program. It's not something that's given anywhere else that I'm aware of, but in our state we do have Epic which has a different criteria. Um, I hope that answers your question. I think so, thank you. The next question I'm seeing is, do SNAP benefits roll over or do you have to use it all that month? SNAP benefits do roll over. I got a story for you. Oh, ooh, uh, so we had a senior who was having difficulty accessing her SNAP benefits. She had already applied. Uh, she maybe had a, a medical, uh, some kind of event that placed her in the hospital. She came home, she was hospitalized for quite some time. She came home, maybe there was some kind of memory issue or recall of what happened because once you've been in the hospital for a while and you've returned to home, it's just like starting fresh, it's, you know, your bills might have piled up, you might have just getting oriented back to being home. So what happens is the um, SNAP benefit comes to you on what they call an EBT card and it is a somewhat of a debit card, but for that particular benefit. It also doubles as a Medicaid card if you have Medicaid, if you're approved for Medicaid. But anyway, back to SNAP. So uh, this person had their SNAP card and she had forgotten because when just much similar to an e, to a ATM card, you have to have a PIN number. Well, on your SNAP card, you have to have a PIN number. So she forgot her PIN number. So she called our office and do we help with the PIN number? No, we don't, but we were trying to relocate her to the number which would then assist her with selecting a new PIN number and we got to talking. And in the process of us talking, I realized that she, well, first of all, it wasn't even in the order that I'm telling you, we came to a point to know that she, I, I did some research um, and she had already had SNAP. I believe the call was she was applying for SNAP but she didn't know where her card went or something. So I went and we looked her up and we found out that she had a card. So then she thought the card was something else. We, we identified the card, she had it in her hands. Okay, this is it. Okay, but what do I do with it? Well, she just forgot her PIN. So we realized we had to get a new PIN number. So I was gonna help her with that. But now the next step was, well, if she has a card, does she have anything on it? So we called the SNAP hotline, um, provided her information and the person had well over a thousand dollars of SNAP because what had happened was she was getting the minimum benefit. You know how I mentioned earlier, people were like, oh, $15, $16, what's that gonna do for me? Okay, well, guess what? During the pandemic, the allotments increased so that people could receive what, a, what you would typically receive as a full benefit. So this person was getting these full allotments during the course of a few months 
which equaled to put her above what she was accustomed to. She was well over a thousand dollars. So we're talking like maybe I received this phone call maybe October, November. So, so she had well received a good amount and hadn't utilized it. So the worker explained to me, listen, she's got maybe like another month, but she needs to start using this before the amount start dropping from the, the latest one. So these benefits can be carried over from month to month. And what was $19 to one person may not be useful to one, but if you save it over the course of time, much like we do our own cash savings, it becomes a whole grocery. During the pandemic, you're not gonna save $200 a month. You're gonna use that because you're gonna use your snack for food and you're gonna take the other, the extra $200 you're not spending on food now to pay towards another bill that maybe you weren't expecting to spend, like all those cleaning products you just finished buying, all the paper towels, or the, you know, whatever it is that you're doing to keep your home manageable and keep yourself safe. Or what about all those uh, masks you didn't foresee having to pay for, whether they're cloth or paper? Um, so yes, it does roll over. Um, I believe it rolls over generally for nine months before it starts dropping off. Not an entire year, but there is a cutoff of about nine months. So I hope that answers your question. I definitely think it does. Thank you, Rachel. The last question I'm seeing here is, can senior services help make copies for forms being submitted? Yes, we can. If you're having difficulty, uh, what you would want to do is if you, Firstly, we do not refuse persons to come into the office in person. We have been fully operational the entire pandemic. We just try to follow safety protocol. Anyone that enters our building needs to have a mask. And if you come into the office and your mask is tattered, I will make sure that you get a replacement mask. Um, but we try to operate pretty safely. And so we'll take your documents, we'll make copies, and we'll hand them back to you. In the same sense, if you're giving us permission and you send originals, we don't encourage this, but if you send us originals in the mail, we will mail them back to you. We'll make copies and we'll mail them back to you. Okay, Rachel, thank you so much for that information. And now I'm just seeing Thank you for the talk, really informational. So thank you very much for thank your presentation. Thank you. thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. And everyone, thank you so much for being here. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you next time.